Hi there, I'm Crystal. I was diagnosed with idiopathic gastroparesis in 2004. Since then, I've become a wife, a mom, I've written two best-selling books about gastroparesis, and I've spent the last 10 years as a coach helping people worldwide learn to live well with the condition. Today we are talking all about eating for gastroparesis with less stress. Stay tuned. Okay, so as a coach, I know that eating for gastroparesis, the gastroparesis-friendly diet, anything around food when it comes to gastroparesis can feel really stressful. It can feel overwhelming and frustrating. And of course, you and I know, after the discussions we've had recently in my videos, that that's not coming from the diet itself. It's coming from a lot of thinking around food and gastroparesis. What should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? What can I never eat again? What happens if I'm going to eat this? Just around and around and around in these thought loops that can feel really stressful, really heavy, really real. And that's what we're going to do today is hopefully provide you with some information that kind of starts to quiet that down a little bit so you can get a little bit of space and start making decisions from a place other than that frantic thinking. And typically that's gonna yield you much better results when it comes to symptom management. So today we're talking about 10 updated guidelines of eating for gastroparesis. Let's get started. So the first guideline is understand the purposes and the limitations of a gastroparesis friendly diet. I actually think this is the most important guideline, which is why I put it at number one, because it really influences everything else we're gonna talk about for the rest of the video. So the purpose of a gastroparesis friendly diet is not to get rid of your delay altogether, it's really just to not exacerbate the delaying gastric emptying too much. So when you were diagnosed with gastroparesis, you likely had a gastric emptying study and you ate a small meal, probably scrambled eggs, scrambled egg whites, uh, bread, you may have, depending on which clinic you were at, had some oatmeal or a small bowl of stew, but it was a small, lowish fat, lowish fiber meal, which would be considered GP friendly, and you emptied that meal more slowly than somebody who does not have gastroparesis. So what we're trying to do with food is to just not exacerbate that existing delay too much to the point where you're really sick and symptomatic. And so everything else we're going to talk about is based on just digestion, right? The science of digestion. It's not necessarily specific to people with gastroparesis because the things we're going to talk about are things that extend the time it takes for the stomach to empty food in everybody across the board. So the purpose of a GP-friendly diet is really as a symptom management tool. It's not something like celiac disease where you have to cut out all gluten. Once you do, your body can heal, your symptoms improve. It's a little bit different. Not that your symptoms won't improve, but unlike celiac disease, gastroparesis isn't caused by the food. It's not caused by what you eat. There is an existing delay. There's something functional in the stomach that is causing it to move more slowly, digest food more slowly. When we misunderstand that, I think that's when we can really get up in our heads, when we're expecting that what we eat is going to make us feel all better, especially if that's really the only symptom management tool that we're using, or just that and medication. We can rely really, really, really heavily on what we're putting into our mouths, and we can try to draw all sorts of conclusions about this particular food, and it just doesn't always work that way. So the guidelines are just that. They're guidelines. They're a place for you to start and experiment. It's not the case that if you eat something that is not within the guidelines, you are doing any sort of damage. Again, I like to use celiac disease as a comparison because it's very clear eating gluten when you have celiac disease is damaging to the body. Eating a higher fat or higher fiber or not GP friendly food when you have gastroparesis is not damaging anything. It might exacerbate your symptoms for a period of time, but it doesn't make gastroparesis worse overall. It's not doing any harm. And so the guidelines are things to follow to help you feel better, but they're not meant to be a super rigid prescription for things you must do to be okay. And so we're going to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of these guidelines. 
Guideline number two, eat smaller meals. So the number one determinant of gastric emptying time is the size of the meal. It is volume of food in your stomach. So the first thing we can do to not exacerbate the delay and exacerbate symptoms is to just eat smaller amounts of food at a time. And that may correspond to eating it more frequently throughout the day. So instead of three bigger meals, you might have four, five, six smaller meals throughout the day. Now a smaller meal for you might be different than a smaller meal for somebody else. So you want to think about half of a normal size meal in a lot of cases. It might be about a cup to a cup and a half of food. Now you do not have to get in there with a measuring cup. Again, that level of minutia is not necessary. That is coming from a brain that really wants to take control. Now you don't have to just have one food. You can have several different foods. It can be a meal, just a smaller version of the meal. We're really just looking to eat less food at one given time to allow the stomach to empty more quickly than it would if we ate a big meal. Guideline number three, eat less fat. Now I said less fat, I did not say no fat. Fat is really important for our bodies to function properly. It's important for us to digest certain vitamins. It's not necessary to cut out all fat from your diet if you have gastroparesis. In fact, most people do well on a lower fat diet, which falls somewhere between 30 and 50 grams of fat a day. Some people might go a little lower, around 25, but that's a pretty significant range. And so there's a lot of experimenting to do in there to find what works for you. But the first things you can do is just start choosing lower fat versions of the things that you're eating. And you can also just cut down on the added fat that you're using. So if you're using oil or butter, you wanna just cut that way down, maybe about a teaspoon instead of a tablespoon. You want to think about leaner meats, choosing leaner cuts of meat. You wanna think about lower fat versions of things you're already eating. So lower fat dairy products, for example, if that's something that you're eating. Even if you're not doing dairy, if you do like a full fat oat milk, you would wanna do a low fat oat milk instead. So it's not necessary to just eat like non-fat foods and that's it. You just want to start think about reducing the fat because you can keep reducing and reducing until something feels tolerable for you, but cutting out all the fat, that's going to adversely affect your nutrition and your overall health and probably your satisfaction with the food that you're eating as well. Guideline number four, eat less fiber. Now again, I said less fiber. I did not say no fiber. Fiber is also really important for our health and for our digestion and other parts of our GI tract. And it is not necessary to remove all fiber from a gastroparesis friendly diet. Most people do well with around 12 to 15 grams of fiber a day. Now I want to point out here that we don't have studies on the gastroparesis friendly diet. So when I'm giving you these estimates for range of fat grams, size of meals, range of fiber, this is just kind of the accumulation of the experience of practitioners over time who work with people with gastroparesis. It's kind of a best practices based on what we've seen in the real world. But there's a lot of room to experiment here because there are no studies or scientific data to tell us this is exactly the right amount of fat or fiber for a person with gastroparesis. So a range to start in would be 12 to 15 grams. See how that works for you, see how you feel, and kind of go from there. Again, this doesn't mean you cut out any kind of fruit or vegetable or grain. You just wanna think about portion size. The first way to reduce the amount of fiber in anything is to eat less of it. So if you eat a huge plate of vegetables, you eat a smaller plate of vegetables, automatically lower in fiber. You might also want to think about making some swaps. So if you eat brown rice, you'd want to eat white rice. You want to look especially for products with added fiber. So if you're eating packaged bars or cereals or shakes, it's kind of like hip right now for companies to add a lot of fiber to things so they can slap a label on there to make it seem healthy and they say oh it's higher in fiber and that can um, not be great for people with gastroparesis. You can find shakes that have 8, 10, 12 grams of fiber at this point and it's just all added fiber that the company is adding in. So you want to make sure you're looking at nutrition labels but you don't have to again necessarily 
you know, be entering this into a computer program and, and checking um, the exact amounts every day. You want to focus on decreasing and, and kind of do it in a more relaxed way. Guideline number five, slow down and chew your food. So how we eat can actually be just as important as what we eat when it comes to our digestion. Digestion begins in the mouth with the mechanical breakdown of food from our teeth and our saliva, which has enzymes in it and starts to break down food. So we think that everything happens with digestion once it gets to our stomach, but that's not true. And if we don't really focus on chewing our food, we're missing an entire step of the digestive process and kind of starting the stomach at a disadvantage anyway. So slowing down and chewing kind of go hand in hand because when you're chewing your food really well, it forces you to slow down. When you're slowing down, you're usually chewing your food better and paying attention to the cues that your body's giving you. Again, this is not something that you have to really obsess over. You don't have to count the number of times you chew your food. You don't have to be consumed by it, but just have it in your mind that digestion starts in your mouth. And so you're doing a stomach a favor by chewing your food thoroughly before you swallow it. Number six, limit hard to digest foods. So this is gonna be things with like seeds, peels, hulls. You wanna think about things like popcorn, apples that have the peel on them, potatoes that have the peel on them, anything harder to digest, even things like broccoli, uh, dried fruits, anything like that that is just a little bit more difficult for the stomach to break down completely, you wanna really limit those. Now for some people, harder to digest foods is also going to include things that are high in FODMAPs, for example. And FODMAPs are fermentable carbohydrates. This is not an issue for everyone with gastroparesis, but for some people with gastroparesis, these higher FODMAP foods really do exacerbate symptoms, especially things like bloating, pain, distension, burping. So. If you are sensitive to FODMAPs and if you have talked with a dietitian, if you've had testing to confirm that you're sensitive to FODMAPs, then you might want to follow a low FODMAP diet and include that in limiting harder to digest foods because for your body, those foods that are high in FODMAPs are harder to digest. Number seven, choose a variety of foods. So for this one, I often say that you want to eat the GP friendly rainbow. Right, We want to think about getting as many colors in our diet as possible. A lot of typical GP-friendly diets tend to be made up of like white and brown and beige foods. And we want to just think about getting more color into the diet because this is automatically going to get us more nutrition. And I have a download on my website, I'll actually put the link in the description below, that lists out all of the different GP friendly foods of various colors and how you can prepare them. So some are GP friendly as juices, some are GP friendly as purees, some are GP friendly as is. So you can go ahead and look down in the description if that's something that you're interested in. But the key here is really to choose a variety of foods. We don't wanna be eating just low fat, low fiber carbohydrates, just you know cereal and bread and waffles and whatever. You really wanna focus on getting a variety of types Types of food, a variety of macronutrients, so that's protein, fat, and carbohydrates in a variety of colors, and that way you're going to automatically be diversifying your nutrition, which is what we really want. A lot of times people think that they just get worse and worse and worse as they have gastroparesis, and I think a lot of that just comes from really poor nutrition and getting deficient in minerals and vitamins and protein as you have gastroparesis longer and as you're clinging really tightly to the guidelines of a typical GP-friendly diet, which does not emphasize nutrition. Number eight, add in nutrient-dense liquids as needed. So some people think that when they have gastroparesis, they automatically have to go on a liquid diet. This is rarely the case. Most people with gastroparesis do fine eating solid foods. If you have a flare-up, you may do more liquids for a while. Liquids tend to empty more quickly from the stomach than solid foods do. That kind of makes sense if you think about the breakdown that needs to be done with solid food versus something that's already a liquid. Now, thicker liquids, higher fat liquids, those are still going to digest more slowly than thinner, lower fat liquids, but some people find they do really well with things in liquid form that they might not otherwise tolerate. And this is where things like smoothies and purees come into the picture. 
There are also a variety of nutrition drinks available, and that can be a great choice for someone with gastroparesis to supplement throughout the day. So rather than replace a meal with a nutrition shake, you can sip on it throughout the day. I like to mix it with water so that it's a little thinner, and then it can just be something that you consume throughout the day on top of your other meals in order to boost that nutrition. And a lot of people have really good luck with that. So there are a lot of things you have to look out for nowadays with nutrition shakes because of what I said in the section we were talking about fiber, like companies are adding so much stuff to these shakes. They're adding all kinds of fiber. A lot of them are adding like coconut oil and really jacking up the fat, all kinds of things to make them, you know, healthier, which then makes it more difficult for people who, you know, have digestive conditions who are looking to use these nutrition shakes. So if that's of interest, I could potentially do a video on, you know, the best nutrition shakes available, but you want to always just look at the label. If you're looking at a fat amount, you probably don't want to go much higher than, you know, eight to 10 grams. If you're looking at a fiber amount, you probably don't want to go much higher than three grams. Um, and you'll have to experiment because taste varies widely among those shakes. But the point here is to supplement as necessary either your nutrition or your meals with nutrient-rich liquids. Number nine, listen to your gut. Now, this is kind of a little double entendre here because I do mean listen to your gut literally, like listen to how your gut feels, listen to your symptoms. If you are feeling super nauseous and all that sounds good is crackers, eat crackers. It's okay. It doesn't mean you have to eat crackers for every meal forever. Really, in the moment, listen to your gut. If you're feeling really good and you want to eat something that's not GP friendly and that feels like something that might be okay and you're, you're, you know, you're, it feels like your stomach's moving pretty well today, go for it. You know, like I said, that's not going to do you any harm in the long term. I think we think that our diet is static, right? And this is what I have to eat every single day. And that's just not true. Our stomachs function at different rates every day for all kinds of reasons. When I talked about the gastroparesis symptom bucket, if you haven't seen that, go back and watch the FAQ video. But, you know, there are all kinds of things that fill our bucket. And so we're going to feel better on different days, you know, days when you're you're less constipated, less stressed, not around your, your menstrual cycle if you're somebody who has a period, you might be able to eat more than you would on a day when all of those things you know, were happening. So listen to your gut. I mean, literally your gut. Listen to how you feel in choosing the foods that you're going to eat. And I also mean listen to your gut in terms of like your intuition because I don't know you right? You know you better than I know you. And I can give you guidelines, but you know what's going to work for you better than I know what's going to work for you. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And when it doesn't feel like that, that's because we're trying to make decisions from up in our head. That's because we're in one of those thought loops and we think that the answer is at the end of our thinking. The answer is never at the end of your thinking when it's something like that. It's just you're not going to get there, right? Your thinking is a loop. And so when you're agonizing over, do I eat this or do I eat that? Is it okay to eat this? You're not going to find the answer up here. You're going to find the answer by kind of tuning in, letting that all settle, and you're going to do what occurs to you, right? And if something occurs to you and it you eat it and you still get symptoms, like that's okay. As I said, that's not going to cause you any trouble in the long run. You might have symptoms in the short run, but you can do that. That's okay. It's okay to experiment. And that actually leads right in to the last guideline, which is to experiment and to do what works for you. And this is going to vary widely among people with gastroparesis. There is not one one size fits all diet for gastroparesis. These are guidelines. They're a place to start, but they are not meant to be really strict, rigid rules that you have to follow all the time in order to be okay. That causes us so much stressful thinking, and it puts way too much emphasis on everything that goes into our mouth. And when we are that uptight about everything that goes into our mouth, we do not digest food as effectively. Because when we're nervous, when we're upset, when we're worried, our stomach actually puts out fewer enzymes. Our stomach actually slows down the whole digestion process because we're in a stressed out fight or flight state. And so it's completely counterproductive to be constantly worried about every single thing we put in our mouth. 
And that worry is just coming from this misunderstanding that whatever that thinking is going on in our head is true or important or something we have to pay attention to. Like I said, you're not going to find the answers at the end of those thoughts because they're just going in a loop. And so you can have all of that thinking and you can just not play with it. You can not feed it, so to speak. You can just not go there. You can know that it's there and you can still go about doing what makes sense to you in the moment. And it's my hope that this video and these guidelines are going to help you do that. Now, doing what works for you might also mean cutting out foods that are part of a typical GP-friendly diet. For some people, that might mean dairy. It might mean gluten. Even if you don't have celiac disease, certainly if you do, then gluten's not going to be part of your GP-friendly diet. But for some people, it might mean soy. And this is really going to vary. There was a time when across the board, I recommended that everybody cut out this stuff and see how they feel. But I think for a lot of people, that contributes to a lot of this thinking. And it can feel really restrictive and it can get really overwhelming. And so I think experimentation is really the key here and listening to your gut. If you have kind of a gut feeling, not from this thought loop, not I should, I, I should cut out dairy, I think dairy might be a problem, everybody else seems to cut out dairy, not from up here. But if you just kind of have that gut like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I cut out dairy. Maybe cut it out for a week or two and see if you feel any different, right? So it's just a much looser approach to all of this. And so hopefully listening to all of these guidelines has gotten you in a place where you see the purposes, the limitations of a diet, you have some guidelines in which to start your experimentation, and we can allow whatever this thinking is going on up here to just kind of settle down and start making decisions from a more relaxed place. I hope that was helpful. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. You can join my mailing list over at crystalsaltrelli.com, and I will talk to you again very soon.